Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you all here and welcome you to Draminis. If you're back after holidays, I hope you've enjoyed your break. If you're visiting with us, it's great to have you here. And God willing, um, even you might play your role as ambassadors encouraging others back in the coming weeks. Um, I always love September for that, um, for seeing the faces coming back in the door and gathering ourselves more fully as the weeks go by. From next Sunday, we're back to 10.30 um, for worship here at Dreminis and midday at Red Rock. So maybe if you're speaking to folks during the week, remind them that it's back to normal time, 10.30 and midday. Then two weeks from today, God willing, we will have Sunday school and Bible class coming back. So that's Sunday the 11th of September. And that will be a, a significant marker point in coming back to church. And then something that I, I would give you heads up to, which is an Arma presbytery thing as opposed to a whole PCI-wide thing. But on the 18th, um, and I know because I'm taking some responsibility for it, there'll be a, a presbytery-wide survey of attendance at worship. I am giving you the heads up. Um, we, we will all be recorded in terms of attendance back at worship post-COVID, um, some of those realities, some of the age categories that we all fit into to get an idea um, across our presbytery of where the life of our denomination is at. That will take place on the, the 18th. Um, so can I encourage you, um, for our own sake, in terms of where we're at, um, these few Sundays that come up in September, Sunday school back on the 11th, and then there'll be a, a survey Sunday on the 18th. Could I also ask that anyone here this morning who's an owl, an owl is an older, wiser, livelier senior, if you're retired age, um, can you briefly head into the red room afterwards? Carol would like to see you for a minute. Um, and begin the journey of OWL's activities for the winter. So if you're in the OWL category, can you take a pop into the Red Room after the service? And then one last thing, can I say thank you, and I'm sure you all would agree with this, to Jim McGaw. Jim works tirelessly sorting out bits and pieces regarding property. And in the last week, Jim has um, helped sort out the wee bits of glass from the windows in the old church. For those of you who wanted a little memento in that way, Jim, can I say publicly a big, big thank you for all that you continue to do um, in organising those bits and pieces property-wise. We all deeply appreciate it, and thank you for what you do. We're here to worship God, not for announcements, uh, and a good reminder as we come to worship is found in the words of Psalm 33, where the psalmist writes this. He says, sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It's fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on a ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice and the earth is full of his unfailing love. By his word were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And he gathers the waters of the sea into jars and he puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. This is the Lord we come to worship this morning. Not just creator God, not just the Lord who is perfect in his character, but God who is savior and God who one day will be judge. He alone is righteous. And so we come to, to use our voices to bring him the praise that he deserves. So whether you're two or three or four or 50 or 95, God calls you this morning to bring your voice, to bring your, your breath, to come and praise him. We're going to do that as we stand and sing together. Lord of creation, to you be all praise. Most mighty your working, most wondrous your ways. Um, let's clear out the cobwebs. Let's use our voices and sing praise to God together. Let's stand as we sing. <laughs> Yeah. 
take our seats together. Words that we've just sung that tie in with what we'll be thinking about this morning. Um, God of all bounty. Um, God who is self-sufficient. God who has everything he needs. God who can give generously to his people as he does. Um, this morning we come to the Lord who only knows how to give good gifts to his people. Um, the Lord who wants the best for his children. Um, and this morning, that's something I need to keep reminding myself of. That God wants the very best for his people. And as we listen to his word, as we walk in his way, we've been singing that, it's because he knows what is best for us. And he wants what is best for us. So let's come to such a father in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we quieten our minds and our hearts before you this morning. And we thank you for the, the lovely privilege that is ours at the beginning of a new day, very particularly a Sunday morning, to come and to pour out our worship, to shout praise to the Lord who is King, who is gracious and good and perfect and wise, and who only knows how to give good gifts to his children. Lord, help us as we, we pause again this morning to remember that you're the righteous one. Father, we try at times to do the right thing and we barely can do an hour, never mind a day, without saying things wrong, without acting in a way that would dishonor you, without thinking thoughts which are unclean and impure and distance us from ourselves. And yet, Lord, we come to you this morning and you're perfect in your righteousness. Lord, as we bow before you, help us today to see you for who you are, a holy God who has been merciful to us. Lord, I pray this morning that for each of us, whether we're young in the Christian faith following you, or we've been a disciple for 70 years, Lord, this morning, help us to see afresh how generous and good you are, how precious is your gift of salvation. And Lord, help us to hunger again for the truth of your word. Lord, I pray today for each of us that we would learn to lean on you. Father, forgive us when we trust our own gifts, our own wisdom, our own abilities. Lord, forgive us for that this morning and teach us afresh to lean on you. Lord, once again, we thank you for the gift of Christ. We thank you that you reached to us, that he came and lived the perfect life that we couldn't, that he died in our place, that he bore our sin, that he rose and triumphed over the grave. And today, our King Jesus is seated at your right hand. And so we come to bring him praise for who he is and all he has done. Lord, thank you today for brothers and sisters in Christ, that we're here with others who love you. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd enable us to spur each other on to love and good deeds, and all the more as we see the day of Christ's return approaching. Lord, thank you for this time, and we pray that by your Spirit, through your Word, you would speak to us, you would shape us, and even this morning, we'd meet again with our living, loving God. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to read this morning from the Psalms one more time um, before we come back into the winter and, and look at a new series. But this morning we're in Psalm 115, if you want to, to look that up in your pew Bibles. Psalm 115, it's on page 615 um, in our pew Bibles. And we're going to read all of Psalm 115. This is God's word. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and your faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. Eyes, 
but they cannot see. They have ears, but cannot hear. Noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but cannot feel. Feet, but they cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them. And so will all who trust in them. O house of Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He'll bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord make you increase, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. It's not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Boys and girls, come on up to the front, and I'm going to come down and talk to you for a little minute. Um, it's great to see so many of you reappearing. Super. Great. I'm going to take these things out of the way, and then we can fit everybody on the front seat. There we go. Bang, crash, wallet. You happy in there? You can come, there's a, there's a space down here if you want it. And then we're going to all slide along the front row. Good man, good lad, you come over there. And then girls all slide along this way. And we, pardon? Is that your birthday today? Wow, happy birthday to you both. Slide along, slide along, slide along. I'm glad to know that information. I should have remembered. Can we all hop up? Super. Right, where do you think I'm going? Any idea? The beach? Yeah, the, the, Joshua, you are on the ball. That's a great idea. Anybody else want to go to the beach? Climbing. Rock climbing? Okay. Do you know what? Um, there were some in my house when they were smaller thought that this was part of some sort of special play area that you could go climbing. I'm not going to try this morning. I'd be too heavy. I'm not going to the beach. I'm not going rock climbing. Can any of you think, will you be putting a bag on your back this week? Have you... Elsie? No, nope, not climbing the mountain. No, nope, definitely not. Not today. School. School. Just say it under your breath, school. Any of you want to go there this week? Not really. Will any of you have to go there this week? Yeah, some of you will. And, and over these next few weeks, we will think about going back to school. Um, and we will be praying for you this morning as you go back to school. And we might even think a bit more about that in the next few weeks. What, what do you enjoy at school? What sort of things do you do? That's your sister. She wants in. Yep, space for Lucy. What do you do at school? Work. Work. Do you have to read books? Do you get playing with your friends? Yeah. You do? Okay, let me show you something. Church isn't school. It really isn't. But I have four words in here. Four L's. Anybody's name begin with the letter L? I know it's a Lucy. Sometimes we have a Leanne over there, but it's Sandra this morning. Any other L? Well, I've got four L's for you, and I think they sort of go in a row. So who would like, is anybody like to help me this morning with my L's? Do you want to help, Freddie? Yeah? Okay, up you come. Good man. Here's my first L, and you can hold it up and turn it around. What does that word say? Does anyone, the bigger girls, read it? Learn. Learn. And there's a book. Is the book open or closed? It's open. Do you learn anything with a book closed? Can you read a book when it's closed? If you go into school and have your book closed, the teacher says, open your book. Look at the words. You've got to open it. In the pews here in church, there are Bibles. But you've got to open them to hear what God is saying. You've got a Bible at home, but you've got to open it. It's no use sitting there closed. So here's the first word for the winter. If we want to learn more about God, we're going to have to get our Bible book open. 
There's no point having a Bible and saying, oh, it's great, but never opening it. And I know that you all have Bibles. If we want to learn more about God, we've got to get them open and read. So here's the first thing. We're going to L for, do you want to say it together? Learn. Do you want to say it after three? One, two, three. Learn more about God. Right. And as you learn more about God, who wants to help me with this one? Good girl, on your birthday. Can you see what's on the picture? What's that? A heart. What is a heart all about? Loving people. Right, you come on over beside us. Hop up and go one, two, up you hop and turn it round and show everybody a lovely love heart. We'll turn it around that way. Super. So L for learn more about God. Here's the amazing thing, boys and girls. There are some people, and this is an awful thing to tell you, but the more you get to know them, the less you like them. Did I say that? The more you learn about God, the more you love him. Yeah. See, Jethro, that's, that's what actually being a Christian is all about. It's not just about learning things and being able to answer questions and being able to say, I know, I know my Bible stories. No, 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 no. God wants us to love him, to learn more about him and then say, yeah, I really love this God who gave Jesus for me, who provides all the things that I need, who listens to my praying. I love him. So learn, love. Here's a good one. Yeah, okay, Jethro, this just might be a good one. Yeah. Your daddy will find this somewhat. <gasps> Hold that up and show everybody what's on that one. Now, what's the picture of? A house. And what's up against the house? A ladder. And the ladder is leaning against the house. Can you, if you've just got a straight ladder like that, I know you can get ones like A-shaped ladders that can sit in their own, but a normal straight ladder, you can't just set it out in the middle of the field and think it's going to stand on its own. Isn't that right, Joshua? You can just set it there. You have to lean it against something. And then it stands up and you can climb it, usually, quite safely. Do you think it's an all right ladder? You could use the gate dip for a ladder. That's quite clever too, Yeah. God, Here's, here we go back to the beginning. God wants you to learn about him so that you love him more so that you will lean on him. Now, I can't see God and lean my body on him. I can't do that. But God wants me to take my worries, maybe my school worries, my home worries, the things that make me sad, maybe when you're worried about somebody who's sick. God says, come and lean on me. God is strong. God can hold you up when you feel like you're going to fall over. He says, lean on me. So we've got learn. Then what's the next one? Love. And then lean on God. And here's the last one. It's coming out of my bag now. L4. Live. Live. Did you know that all of you in the front row have something that I wish I had? Who wants to hold it up? Good girl. You come on over here. What have you all got that I wish I had? Okay. Oh, children. <laughs> no, you, you don't have any children yet, I don't think. You've got brothers and sisters. What have, what have you all got? Oh, I do know what you mean, that you're a kid and I'm not. Because that's the answer to the question. I'm, anybody here eight? There's got to be somebody in the front row that's eight. Good, good, two eights. These guys have, I wish I was a kid. You're, you're on the ball. Eight. Yeah, oh, like, thank you. Eight. I'm 48. You've got something I don't have. You've got more years probably to live. I'm getting older. And God says, hold on a minute. God says, that we're to take our lives and we're to use them to let other people know how much we love him. And I, I wish sometimes that I was eight again and that I had all those years. Some people who are older again wish they could turn the clock back to being 48. But for each of us this morning, God has given us years to live. Let's thank him this morning that we're alive and let's use our lives 
to speak. See, this person here in my picture says, God loves you. God says this morning, the more you learn about him, the more you love him, the more you lean on him, the more you live for him. Here are your words for the winter in school. Four L's, are you ready? Everybody, everybody ready to help me? With the four L's, we'll just say them all. Learn, love, lean, live. Moms and dads, you might remember it longer than the children. Learn, love, lean on him, live for him. That might be the story of what we try and do this winter. Let's learn more about him. Let's find ourselves loving him more, leaning on him, and then living for him. Guys, you've helped me brilliantly this morning. Can I gather these up so that I can show them to the boys and girls at Red Rock? Yeah. Thank you so, so much. And then I'm going to get you all to go back down round to your mums and dads, and we're going to sing, um, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Lord, for loving me. So let's all hop round to our mums and dads. Can you find your way? Oh, no, sorry, Sandra, mistake. Um, can we get a sheet and a pencil and a sweetie? And then... Okay, let's get a sheet. <laughs> Do you want, oh, right, we're really having a go this morning. There we go. Anybody else need a sheet? Everybody got a sheet? Good man. And get a pencil and then take it with you. And then, oh. Make sure you get a sweet. It's really good when an older brother's making sure that a younger sister gets a sweet too. Here, all good. A sweet and a sheet, and we're all good. It's all right. Did you get a sheet? There we go. You get a sheet too. Super. Great. We're in business. Could I beg the kindness of one person that got a sheet? Um, I've realised I've given out all the sheets I'd photocopied. It's brilliant to have so many back, and I'm going to need them at Red Rock. So, it, but even if you wanted Ruben to go and photocopy a few for me to take, even ten to take over to Red Rock, and then bring one back for Jethro, would you? Be all right with that? Excellent. Super. Thank you very, very much. Now we're going to sing together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Let's stand as we sing. Thank you. 
take our seats together. Can we take a wee moment just to pray for other people? Um, as I often say to you, there'll be things on your mind that you want to bring before the Lord in prayer. Do that as I lead you. Then we, we thought last week, and we will again this morning, about our children and our young people, um, some getting and have got exam results, and some with great delight, others with question marks as to what next. Uh, many of our children starting back into school, and we want to thank the Lord for the privileges they have and pray for them and their teachers. Um, let's do that. I spoke this week with Phil Dunn of EMF, who some of you have kept contact with, and Phil was updating me, and you may have noticed online that one of their EMF mission partners, a man called Vitaly Mariesh, who we haven't spoken of before, has got his call up in the Ukrainian army, and he felt that the right thing to do was to take that call up, papers that he was sent, and so he has entered into military service as a chaplain. Um, and as Phil said, the man is a, a pastor, not a soldier. Uh, and this is all new to him, but as the, the situation continues to be difficult in that country, um, we want to pray this morning for Vitaly and others like him um, as he serves the soldiers in the role of chaplain. And then finally, something that caught my eye the last couple of days, and, and the news can be strange, things get, in one sense, hidden from us. In Pakistan, um, over this summer, there have been immense floods thousands and thousands of people not only displaced but many thousands who have lost their lives because of the flooding Pakistan is a country of 225 million people 96% of which are Muslim there's a very very small Christian presence in Pakistan um, and for those Christians to witness to their friends is nearly impossible um, very often because the Christians are from the, the lower echelons of society, the lowest rung, um, and they're not listened to. And on top of that, um, if you're a Muslim in, in Pakistan, the, the price for becoming a Christian, the price of apostasy, is there's a, a bounty on your head and you're to be sought out and killed by your family. That's the reality of being a Christian in Pakistan. And so this morning we want to pray for that nation. We want to pray for gospel outreach, two people in that land, and as trouble comes, which obviously the floods have been, that people's minds and hearts would be turned to the living God. And so let's pray, let me lead you, and join with me as we pray for others. Father, there are, are so many things on our hearts and mind this week. We have loved ones in hospital. We have friends who have had accidents and injuries. We know of people who are discouraged and going through low times in life father we bring our concerns to you and we pray for our loved ones and we ask that they would know your peace and your healing hand today we pray for our young people father thank you for many who have rejoiced in good exam results we pray for those particularly who are wrestling with what the future might hold be the lord who leads and guides help our young people to lean on you and look to you for the next step in their lives. We pray this morning for Vitaly Mariesh and his role as chaplain in the Ukrainian army. We pray you'd protect him. And on the front line, that you would enable him to open up your word and speak to, to those around him of Christ of an, and a hope that goes beyond the grave. Lord, we pray to you this morning for the nation of Pakistan. We're overwhelmed by the, the thought of being such a small Christian minority. And yet, Lord, we know that your word has power, your gospel is truth, that you can reach into the darkest places with a light that shines. And so, Father, give Christians in that nation this morning courage to know that you're with them and that they can stand strong in all the trouble around them. We pray for aid, work, and relief in the flooding we pray that the the weather conditions would change and that those lord who have lost homes and loved ones would be leaning on you and looking to you rather than any false notion of god and so lord help us today as we open up our bibles as we listen to you for it's in jesus name we pray amen 
is a, a, an incredible privilege that we get these moments, that we can open up our Bibles, that we not only have been exposed to the truth of the gospel, but we have Bibles open to read. And, and this morning we live in a place where we're not a, a small, small number. There are many of us who, who want to hear what God's word has to say. So let's take these next few minutes and let's open up God's word together in Psalm 115. There will be a, a, a cover or a, a one sheet, one slide that comes up on the screen of what I want to say this morning. So um, these are, are points that relate to the psalm that we've read and it allows you to divide up what we've read and maybe even when you go home later on um, that you'll spend a minute or two uh, thinking through what we have read today. Let me start, and, and I don't necessarily want to do anything by way of introduction, but just run straight into to verse 1. 607 years ago, and those of you who can do the maths, that takes you back to the middle of the early in the 15th century. 607 years ago, when Henry V was king of England, and he'd been a wild man in his youth, he could have, had life not ended for him at the age of 35, um, many thought that he would be emperor of Europe. He, he seemed to be a, a superb leader. And in 1415, he crossed over from England, to France, and his aim w was a, a desire to unite Christendom to fight the advancing Turks in the Ottoman Empire. That, that was what he wanted to do. And so he left England on the 11th of August, took 1,300 ships and 11,000 men with him, and he met the French, which was his first battle, at a place, and you'll begin to, to realize there's a story, there's a name you know, at a place called Agincourt in 1415. And King Hal, as he was known, um, fought in battle and had an overwhelming victory against the French. But what makes the story interesting is that before he had come to the throne, and it shows how different the times were, his father had given him a portion of scripture to lead and, and direct his life. And it was Psalm 115. And as the English troops defeated the French at the Battle of Agincourt, before they moved on any further, King Henry told the soldiers to kneel in the mud. And he joined them in singing together, non nobis domine, sed tibi, sed gloria. And I don't have one word of Latin. But he got them to sing Psalm 115. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. It was the finest hour in the king's life. They had defeated the French. He had won the battle. Everybody could have lauded him. He had been in the middle of the fight. And here he is, and he tells the soldiers to kneel in the mud. And he joins them. And he says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. First thing I want to highlight this morning from the psalm. And it is a principle for life, and I hope and pray maybe a principle for what we do this winter at Draminus. We need that spirit in us that says, Lord, not to us, oh Lord, not to us the glory, but to your name alone is the glory. A wild young prince who had it all, and then on the battlefield is his finest star, and yet he kneels in the mud, and he professes the greatest life lesson of all, the glory is yours, God, not mine. And this is where I want to start this morning, and I hope start this winter. Um, God alone is worthy of all the glory. And to put it maybe into more contemporary speak that young people might understand, it's not all about you. It's not all about you. Life is not all about you. Church actually is not all about you. Sometimes um, we get into a tangle where we think that church has to be what I want it to be because I'm the customer and church needs to give me what I want. No, it's not all about you. It's not all about me. It's all about him. One of the greatest challenges, I believe, of being a 21st century Christian, as opposed to a Christian maybe in the 15th century, is that we live in a world that more than ever is self-centered, self-obsessed, and you see that in all the focus on self-image uh, and how we selfie ourselves constantly. Uh, and we live in a world that is constantly projecting self, which then very often leads to a sense of self-importance and self-entitlement 
and sadly, self-sufficiency. That I can manage on my own. Don't help me. King Henry V realized at this key moment in his life on the battlefield that it wasn't all about him. Isn't that remarkable? In the middle of the fight, in the middle of the, the hottest moment of his life, he gets the soldiers to kneel in the mud and say, boys, it's not about us. It's about him. It's utterly counter to biblical gospel Christianity to think like, to, to, to be self-centered. And it's utterly counter to the culture you live in to see life as being all about the Lord. And the psalmist so helpfully sets out and he says, the glory belongs to you for your love and your faithfulness, your love that is unearned and so gracious, your faithfulness that is undeserved and so consistent. It's all about you, Lord. All I am, all I have, my salvation, my possessions, any change in my character that comes about because of the gospel, my serving the Lord is all because God is at work in me. So lesson one for winter 22, 23, God is glorious. It's not all about me. Turn our eyes away from self and fix our eyes on Jesus. That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. And if you want to look down at the next few verses, verse two to eight, and this very interesting little section, God is alive, God is living. Relationship with him is what life is all about. This little section starts with a, the cynical cry of the unbelieving nations, where is your God? Now, it was a, an interesting observation to make and it made sense from their point of view because all the gods that they knew of were handmade gods. Or if you hadn't a handmade God, you might worship the sun or the stars, but their gods were things. Their gods were physical. Their gods were tangible and touchable. And so they say to Israel, Israel, where's your God? You don't have a God. You, you, you worship a God you can't see. And so rightly the psalmist says, yes, but our God is in heaven. And more than that, he does what he pleases. He is sovereign. And more than that, not like your gods made of stone and wood and silver and gold who have eyes but they can't really see, ears that you've put on them but they can't hear, lips but they can't speak, noses but they can't smell, hands but they can't touch, feet but they can't walk, they can't go anywhere. You see, the psalmist in his retort to the nations is profoundly reminding God's people that he is sovereign, he is king, and he is alive. He is in contrast to any other god. These idols, they might have a mouth, but not a peep out of it, ears, but they can't hear your cries. And you see, the psalmist contrasts that with the Lord who we love and to whom we belong. A believer, a Christian, someone who walks with God, has a heavenly father who speaks. He's spoken his word, we have it in our pews. He's spoken his final word, Jesus. He speaks still by his spirit through his word when we open our Bibles. What a joy it is to have a voice, to hear his voice, to have someone speak, to not feel as if you're completely lost and alone, but to know that God is a speaking God, a voice of reassurance, a voice of authority, a voice that proves he's alive, a God with eyes whose eyes are on your situation. This morning, the more I talk to people, the more I've become aware that what really, really hurts people is when they feel like they are invisible, when they feel like people don't see them or people don't care about them. It really gets to the nub of what it is to be human. Hagar, in the Old Testament, spoke of God as being the God who sees me. This morning, even if you feel like nobody else really sees what's going on in your world, God sees. He is a living God. He speaks. He sees. He has hands to hold and embrace, to hold you in the storms of life. He has feet, the Lord who comes to you in Christ, who took on flesh, who didn't leave us on our own but came to us, and who walks with us. Our God is a living God. Sometimes we get lost 
in our earthly idols that are ultimately no use to us. Some of them are, when I say trivial, the stuff that we have, the possessions we own, the sports that we get enthusiastic about, they're not harmful necessarily, they're just pastimes. And we know really in, in heart, they are in one part idols that we, we lose some of our heart to. But probably most of us are more sensible and, and actually the, the thing that we hold closest are people. We crave relationship. Sometimes we make people our idols, whether it's a parent or a partner or a spouse or a friend. And in a way, we're getting close. We're getting warm in terms of what we're made for. We're not made for stuff. We're made for relationship. <laughs> but no friend or partner or loved one can ever take the place of God. Not even the closest human relationship can save us or transform us or protect us from sin and judgment. We are made for relationship with him. That's why that matters above all things. Can I encourage you this winter? Invest in relationship with the living God. He is God on the throne. He is glorious. It's not all about you. He's alive. Don't let your Christianity be a going through the motions of doing church and going home, doing church and going home. Come to know this speaking, listening, living God. Open your Bibles, listen to his voice. Open your mouths. Talk to him in prayer. Get to know him through his word and love him more. It's a relationship. He's a living God. Three, God is trustworthy. Lean on him. Verse 9 to 11, let me flick back to it in my Bible. Um, o house of Israel, trust in the Lord, he is their help and shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord, he is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord, he is your help and shield. The Psalms, many of them, were written for use in public worship. I didn't do it this morning, but I, I could have taken those few verses and said, look, I'll lead the Psalm and I'll read, O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. And you could have responded, he is our strength and shield. He is our help and shield. Three times it's repeated. You see, when in God's word you see something once, you should listen to it. When you see it twice, you should whoops, open my eyes and really listen to it. If God has something to say to us three times in a row, then we need to drop everything else that we're doing and realize that this matters. God, who is the glorious sovereign king, who is alive this morning, is the Lord who can be your shield and your helper and your protector and the source of all you need. And he says to you, trust, trust, trust. Can I use the word slightly differently? and do what I did with the children. Lean, lean, lean. God says, trust in me, lean on me. One of my favorite verses in all of God's word comes from Proverbs 3, and verse five and six, where God tells us to trust in him with all our hearts, lean not on our own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll make your path straight. It says, look, don't lean on yourself. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own ability. Don't lean on your gutsy strength to get through. Don't lean on your streetwise canny to outdo other people. Lean on him. To lean on Christ means stopping leaning on myself. Stop leaning on others to lean on Christ is a surrender and so this morning again I don't know every detail of your life but maybe there's somebody here and as yet you haven't leaned on him for salvation you're saying I will march up to the doors of heaven and I'll tell God that I'm not too bad the Lord says no you've got to lean and rest on me and what Christ has done Otherwise, you'll not be forgiven. Maybe somebody here this morning, uh, and whatever trouble you're facing at home, and you're trying to handle it all yourself, God says, <clears throat> lean on me. Bring the problem to me. Rest in me. Trust in me. Talk to me. Lean on me. Maybe you can't make sense of what life has dealt you at the moment. God says, bring those things to me and lean 
on me. We're taught from very, very young to try and be tough and to manage. The gospel is counterintuitive. God says, come and lean on me. When you know what I'm like, when you know who I am, when you know how much I love you, the Lord says, lean on me. Maybe this winter is going to be a leaning winter where you learn to open up your Bible and say, Lord, you've made promises and I'm coming to you. I'm going to lean on you. Four. Verse 12 to 15. God is a God of generous blessing. So crave the things that are for your spiritual good. God blesses generously. Let's learn to crave good things. This is what God is like. Again, just like the previous verses where the repetition of trust, God is your shield and strength. Now in these verses, the word that repeats again and again is bless. Bless, bless, bless. Even God remembering to bless. In other words, God has made promises. He has covenanted. He is a, a God of covenant. And he has promised to bless his people. First thing, realize what true blessing is. When God speaks of blessing or increase, he's not talking about material. He's not talking necessarily about physical things or even your physical health. Can I say it again at the beginning of the winter? Don't get caught up in a, a Christianity or in maybe voices that you hear on TV, religious voices or books that you might read that tell you that trusting in God should mean necessarily that you get more money, that your health is good, and you, you get all your dreams come true, that God is some sort of fairy God who, who gives you what you want. When you hear those things, can I encourage you to be a growing Christian? When you hear those things talked about, get a wee bit anxious, get a wee bit nervous, and run fast. It's not to say that God isn't generous. It's not to say that God won't answer your prayers and the kids will do well in their exams or that their futures will work out well and they'll, they'll find life partners who love the Lord and, and all of those things. It's not to say that God won't make things work out well. But the minute that you think that God's blessing is you getting what you want, you've missed the gospel. You see, to be blessed is to be blessed by the Lord. Firstly and foremostly, blessing from God is salvation for those who fear him. The greatest blessing is sins forgiven, peace with God, purpose in life, and a home in heaven. What can man give in exchange for his soul? And this blessing is available for all, great and small. The young and the old, the rich and the poor, the exam passers and those who didn't do so good, the cool and the geeky, the popular and the friendless, and the list goes on. God says this blessing it's for all who will fear me. Isn't it incredible this morning? Because, I mean, I still, am I allowed to rant slightly? All the Facebook, hashtag blessed, blessed, blessed. And every, everybody puts up hashtag blessed when they get something good, when something amazing has happened. When they, and yes, that is a blessing from God, and it's not to be trifled. But the greatest blessing of all is to know him as Savior, to walk with him daily, and to know that one day you will go to be with him. That is what it is to be blessed. And so this morning, for any single one of us, you can live in that blessing. You don't have to have the biggest brain in the house. You don't have to have the biggest bank account in the house. You just need to know the assurance of sins forgiven and the blessing of belonging to God. Let me tell you a little story and then I'll move on and finish. We were in Donegal two weeks ago. Last afternoon, Friday, some of you will remember Friday week ago, it was windy and sunny and the waves were big. My brother and I decided we know where the waves are particularly good and so we headed the car to a beach at Fanad Peninsula in Donegal and sure enough, were the waves big? The waves were, oh I don't know, up to the height of the lights along the side here at some parts um, and when you're smaller you think, oh those aren't very big but John and I were looking going, nah, don't fancy that. And I particularly don't fancy that with half a dozen young people in the sea with us. So to much annoyance, especially on one child, and it wasn't in my family, so my children do not take the gun out at me. It was my niece, and Lucy was miffed. Totally miffed. She wanted in the sea. She wanted a bodyboard. She wanted to surf in on her um, paddleboard. And John and I said, you know what? We don't like the look of this. Back in the cars went round the corner to a sheltered bay that we knew 
And sure enough, there were waves, but they weren't just quite as big. And between five o'clock and six o'clock, we piled into the water, body boards running in 30 meters, paddle boards that you could use to surf off, which I've never tried before, but it works if the waves are right. And two fathers who loved their children, who wanted the best for their kids, said, you know what, not there, but here. And it did work out for the best. Do you realize this morning that the Lord who loves you and who wants to bless you knows what is good for you and he calls you to walk trusting in him and listening to him and obeying him because that's where the pleasure is. Which leads me through to where we'll finish. God gives us responsibility to use the time well. Verse 16 to 18, you could read verse 16 and misunderstand and think God has given up on the earth. Um, sometimes, you know, if, if I was in charge, I would look at the earth and go, whoa, I, I could just abandon this project, wipe it all out. God hasn't given up on the earth. He hasn't gone whatever, let everybody do what they want. No, the earth is the Lord's. The heavens are the Lord's. But each in our time, each human being has been given the unique privilege and responsibility in this life of tasks in this world that God gives you to do. And yes, in part, that is being a steward of the planet from Genesis 1 right to Christ's return, especially those who belong to the Lord are not to abuse this gift and responsibility of stewardship of the planet. Don't, don't buy into a, a notion that you can ah, just use and wreck away around you in the world. It doesn't really matter. It does matter. But more than that, in verse 17, the psalmist says, look, it's not the dead who praise the Lord. In other words, it's you who have been given life who are still alive who have been forgiven who god has blessed you live to praise him and extol him and commend him to others here and now and on to eternity can i say lovingly you don't get another go you don't that's why uh, with some wistful melancholy i can say to the kids yeah in part it would be nice to be eight again to get another go those of you who are teenagers, God willing, you have got a span of years ahead of you that is greater than the number of years that I've got left. You get one go at this to take the responsibility that God has given you and to live for his glory, that's where the psalm started, onto the day that he returns. And so take your work, live to his glory. Take your speaking, speak to his glory. Take your friendships, use them to point others to Christ for his glory. Take the people around you in life that you have the privilege of caring for. And even when it's difficult, do that living for his glory. That's your responsibility. He is to be glorified. It's not all about you. He's alive, build relationship with him. He's trustworthy, lean on him. He blesses, crave God's approval and his blessing, the things that matter most. And take your responsibility and use the gift of years that he's given you to give glory back to him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for its truth. And I thank you for the privilege of belonging to you. Lord, we re-consecrate, re-dedicate our lives. You know all about us. But today we take our eating, drinking, sleeping, living, walking about lives. And we present them again to you for this winter. As an offering. And we know that that's our right and reasonable worship. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to finish as we sing together. I realise that... Um, got lost in what I was talking about and the time has run round. I want to sing a beautiful hymn to finish with. There is a hope that burns within my heart that gives me strength for every passing day. Glimpse of glory, now revealed in meagre part, yet drives all doubt away. Um, excuse me when I get to the door, I'm just going to have to beeline on to Red Rock for this morning. But after, um, once we come to next Sunday, um, we'll have a wee bit more time again um, at the end. So excuse me when I run on after. There is a hope that burns within my heart. Thank you.
Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship and companionship and help of the Holy Spirit rest upon us now and forevermore. Amen.